Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Jet Centric Podcast. It's Liz here, and I am super lucky to be joined by Ken Weeb today. So, Ken, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, Ken has always been, uh, you know, one of the more beloved media members for Jets fans, you know, Weaves World on TSN and always being active on Twitter uh, for fans. So um, we've had Ken on the podcast before, but many things have changed uh, since then, since that time. Um, Ken actually has changed jobs in um, that duration of time. So Ken, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the past, you know, year, year and a half for you, what it's been like um, we have covered your origin story before, and I know um, we talked about you playing as a kid and your Altona upbringing and whatnot. So maybe um, some of the more recent things in your life so far, what's, uh, what's been new with you? Sure. Yeah. Since that episode uh, changed jobs once via trade and once kind of via free agency, I guess, if you will, uh, after my almost uh, two decades at the Winnipeg Sun, uh, took the plunge with over at The Athletic with uh, with our good friend Murad Tesh, But uh the pandemic certainly uh, had an impact in my household here as long, you know, along with, uh, you know, just getting laid off uh, back in June uh, with, with I think, 45 other uh, colleagues. So that was certainly something new to go through after having so much stability. Uh, a uh, tough thing for sure, but uh, I was fortunate to be scooped up by sportsnet.ca, I think, uh, shortly thereafter. And even though it's to contract work, uh, hockey fans will know I, I've been calling this my PTO. It's my pro tryout offer. So uh, like a lot of those uh, veteran NHLers that were getting squeezed out by the uh, economic times, uh, I had to kind of go back to your roots and take a bit of a tryout, but uh, certainly been enjoying the process and it's been a good company to work for and was fortunate too to be be in the bubble in Edmonton, uh, not not in the player bubble, but be in the empty arena for those playoffs, which uh, was something that was very interesting to monitor, that's for sure. But uh, certainly interesting times, some challenges, but uh, enjoying it nonetheless. And and then on the side too, this year, I added a little bit of work on uh, the CJOB side where I'm writing one column a week for for them that shows up at globalnews.ca and then also uh, doing some radio with them. But uh, Weeb's World uh, currently on hiatus in terms of uh, my work with Dennis and Sarah, which I've always enjoyed. But uh, Sean Reynolds and I have been trying some fun things, whether it be Instagram lives or some of the TV and digital work we've been doing as well. Great. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize that you were part of the, uh, the bubble in the summer. So that was probably a really uh, neat experience. Do you have any fun stories or anything interesting you can bring up about that, uh, that weird time? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was a different time. I mean, being on the road, there's I mean, much like the teams themselves. I mean, the, the media component, there's always when the playoffs are on, there's usually a fun component of people going out for, you know, for dinners and things like that. But, you know, you never had more than uh, four people at a table. It wasn't quite code red situation yet, but uh, everyone was staying very safe and careful. And it's one of those things where, you know, we all made sure we got a picture, you know, masked up pictures with the empty rink behind and, I mean, you hope you don't see it often, but it's something that you put in the old time capsule and you look back and kind of say that was kind of a cool thing to be part of. But uh, the wildest thing that stood out was was how much uh, beaking was happening with both players and coaches towards the referees. And uh, I think the most memorable example of that was a classic Milan Lucic line where it just happened to go dead silent and he so the only reason you called that was to get on TV and it was, uh, you know, there were only, you know, 20 people in the rink, but everyone heard it very clearly and there were probably a couple of uh, uh, F sharps uh, sprinkled in, but uh, that was kind of one of the funnier uh, on ice moments in a, in a series that was uh, memorable for a lot of other reasons, especially for Jets fans. That's hilarious. I'd never heard that one. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, if I had to you know, pick one player who was in that bubble who would have said something like that, it might've been him. <laughs> so that's, um, that's fun. No, that's good that um, different uh, career options in your life and kind of all these new different experiences. And you said you've been working with Sean Reynolds, who uh, we've had on the podcast before too. Great guy. So, um, and we're hoping to also have him in this episode as well. So um, that'll be super fun. Two of our um, homegrown um, men who have moved on to a bigger, bigger pond with um, Sportsnet. And it's really neat to hear um, from you guys. So um Right now, when I'm talking to Ken here, it is Monday. Um, we are over two weeks out of the big trade that happened. Um, Ken did a big piece on Sportsnet about Pierre-Luc Dubois. So I don't know if you want to kind of dive into that a little bit. You talked to some of his old coaches and people who have worked with him in the past. Um, yeah, just kind of give us a scoop on, on that piece. 
Yeah, it's certainly been interesting. And I mean, uh, so much time and effort has been spent on the the shift, uh, if you will, during these last two weeks, which again, we're not ignoring it. But uh, I think as Pierre-Luc said himself, uh, he's had almost 6,000 shifts in the NHL and you'd be hard pressed to find another one like that one. So uh, certainly was doing a bit of a, not a reference check per se, but it was interesting to see uh, the, the commentary from his coaches, from Marc-Andre Dumas in Cape Breton and then uh, J.F. Fortin, who was the assistant coach to Joel Bouchard uh, in Blainville, both spoke so incredibly highly about him and his character and the amount of effort that he puts in on and off the ice. And uh, the story that stood out from Dumont was the story where he was a 17 year old. They were down two centermen and he asked him if he could play center, even though he hadn't really done it before, other than one tournament uh, for Team Quebec. Uh, not only did uh, Dubois embrace the opportunity, but flat out spent an extra, I don't know if it was half an hour or longer at the end of practice, taking 200 draws with, uh, with a teammate and, and one of the assistant coaches. So when I asked Pierre-Luc about that, he said, well, he was processing what he could do in a two day span or a day span before he started playing. He said, the one thing I could get better at is face off. So uh, the fact that he went out and took 200 of them, I think, you know, speaks strongly to him. And as Mark Andre said, this is a guy who's a star player. He's probably going to be a top 10 pick he could have taken 10 or 15 draws and just said, Hey man, I'm good. Uh, let's just give this a shot. But the fact that he wasn't willing to just accept what would have been acceptable to me really stood out about him as well. And uh, just sounds like a high character guy. And even too, I was fortunate enough to have about 20 minutes with him by phone uh, last week near the end of his quarantine and just his passion for the game of hockey really stood out to me. Uh, you know, we talked so much talk about culture and what the jets are trying to do, but uh, even by his own admission, he said his dad, Eric, who's an assistant coach with the Manitoba Moose, is one of those hockey nerds. So he used to, you know, go over at, at lunch hour during school, go over to the rink and watch a video with him. So this is a guy that genuinely loves the game. Uh, obviously, Jets fans are hoping that he'll plant his flag here in Winnipeg for a longer term deal. And ultimately, that will, you know, probably determine uh, where things go with the trade. But uh, this sounds like a guy who's really excited about the opportunity to play on a big stage and and really embrace uh, both the city and the organization and, and see where that takes him. He obviously has high expectations for himself and uh, there's a lot of things that he wants to accomplish in his career. And I think that this opportunity will be a, a really good one for him, just based on speaking with him and others who know him very well, including David Savard, who he lived with uh, as a 19 year old. Uh, that was really nice to be able to catch up with him on the road and get a little bit of perspective uh, from one of his more recent teammates. Yeah, I've um, I've seen a lot of chatter on Twitter and whatnot about how, oh, David Svart, he's a defenseman uh, UFA at the end of the season, good buddies with Dubois, you do the math kind of thing. And he seems like a really stand-up guy. And um, I know on, I believe it might have been the Ground Control podcast, something that I was listening to, and they mentioned that um, this kind of was, you know, uh, Dubois expected this trade coming, right? And he, so the morning of, he went to spend that last, you know, few moments as a Blue Jacket with the Savard family, which is a really sweet moment. I don't know if you have anything you want to add yeah, to that. For sure. I mean, and the one thing I didn't get it into the story, but that, that was one of the things that stood out. I mean, obviously David and, and Pierre-Luc have a good friendship, but he said it was really hard for his kids. It was one of those first moments where his kids lost a friend because, uh, you know, with Dubois being a guy that was there at 19, he kind of, he was growing up himself in the NHL while David's kids were growing up and to that age where they became very attached to him. And it's one thing to, to talk about the business side and the impact on the players. But when you start thinking about the impact on players, families and, and things of that nature, I mean, it, it really starts to hit home for guys. And I mean, David pointed out, I mean, th those guys are going to be friends for life and he'll see him in the summer. But I think that was kind of one of those, not, not tear jerking moments per se, but something where the emotions of the game uh, kind of get involved as well. And it's the one thing that isn't really talked about. I mean, it's, it's a business for fans, players and, and management alike. So uh, that was one thing that really stood out for me. And, you know, David said how great a player he was, yes, but, and how excited he was for him personally, but it was a tough moment for, for both he and his family to go through. Right. Yeah, of course. And I think that's, that's an interesting point you bring up because we hear so much about how Dubois is coming. His parents live here and his close relationship with his parents. But, you know, whenever you've been somewhere for any amount of time, you have relationships you're leaving there as well. Right. So maybe it's not his father, or his mother or anything like that, but it's still an important family piece there that he's um, leaving. So that's that's neat, though. And it's it's special because, you know, these guys are humans, too. Right. So it's a it's a nice Kind of like you said, it's a bit of a tearjerker, but it's also kind of feel good because you're, you're glad that he had uh, some good memories to bring back from Columbus as well. 
Um, so as of right now, he is slotted in the middle um, with Kyle Connor and Trevor Lewis, right? You were um, watching the practice this morning and yesterday, and you were one of the first sources I saw to tweet out those lines. And I know at my house, it was a, uh, my dad left it open on the computer. He said, Alyssa, did you see these? And like, we're, <laughs> so anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, it was the most popular subject uh, in Winnipeg the past couple of days, and I did get to practice early, and I mean, you're always trying to see what you can figure out by which colors the players are wearing and who's with whom potentially, and I mean, historically, the Jets' top six generally are wearing white jerseys versus the blue, but you thought maybe, uh, you know, Maurice might be trolling us with, you know, trying some different combinations, but uh, when we saw Kyle Connor was also in blue, it, that to me stood out as it was going to be the easy one to figure out in terms of who his line mates would be. Uh, and I know the great debate among Jets fans, and I mean, I would say media alike would be, you would think it would be a natural fit to have Mason Appleton slide right in there in that job right away, because I think he's maybe a little bit more offensive. At least he certainly was at the American League level, and he's really gotten off to a great start this year. But I mean, the, th the flip side of that is that Paul Maurice just went out of his way after the last game against the Flames to talk about how he's starting to view Appleton and Lowry as a pairing. So at a time when he's testing out a few pairings, including a new one in Dubois and Connor, I don't think that we should be overly surprised that it was Trevor Lewis getting that opportunity rather than Appleton right now. But Paul Maurice has also gone out of his way to say, you know, this is another one of the great examples where nothing is permanent. And I would think we're just going to see a little bit more action happening. And the other part of that equation too, is that with Nate Thompson getting closer to being available, I think you will see eventually either Adam Lowry or Paul Stastny go to the wing, but this was a chance to maybe go the four lines deep and see what kind of balance could be provided here uh, in the upcoming in games, especially the one against Calgary. But again, Saying you want to have times between 13 and 17 minutes is one thing. Let's see if they can do it in, in actual game action. But the other thing about Trevor Lewis, too, I mean, the analytics committee community would know that he's a guy that even though he's played a bottom six role, primarily been used on the fourth line, he's, he's been a pretty good play driver and he's a good skater. So I think he'll be able to keep up. And, and then he would also be a bit of a defensive conscious on that conscience on that line as well. So uh, it's probably not as bad a fit as some people would say you you know, when a guy goes from the fourth line to the second line or whatever we want to be calling them, one A, B, and C for now. But it'll be interesting to see. And I personally, uh, I know that you're very familiar with Dubois. I want to see Nikolai Ehlers and Pierre-Luc Dubois together. And again, that's not a knock on Kyle Connor. And I think, we, you know, one of the things we learned, uh, I mean, from Marat's story about uh, the last 15 games that Dubois played was that he's a very good backhand passer. So I think it's natural that you would, you would have one of your best finishers on his left side. But for me, I think that explosive nature and dynamic nature of Ehlers would be pretty well suited to play with Dubois down the line. But again, I also understand that, you know, that line with Ehlers, Shifley and Kopp played a really good game against Calgary in the last game as well. And I think you're going to see Kopp and Shifley stay together a little bit more as a pairing also, because Cop is so defensively responsible and because of his history at center, he can go back and play that down low position if he really needs to. So I think Paul Maurice has a lot of really good options at his disposal. And, you know, like most people, I'm very curious to see and fascinated, quite frankly, to see how all the pieces fit together. Uh, but it's definitely going to be a work in pro progress. The chemistry set will be out and uh, so will the blender. Uh, so be ready for for lots of tweets with the changes changes to those lines. But uh, next couple games will be really interesting. Also because Calgary, quite frankly, uh, went to the blender of their own, and that included Sam Bennett moving up to a line where that Shifley line has actually played quite well against Monahan's line in the series, especially especially lately. Uh, Bennett brought that physical dynamic and ended up getting an important goal against the Oilers. And then the bigger development for Calgary was that. Michael Backlund, who had been really struggling, uh, had a really excellent game, both offensively with Milan Lucic and also against Connor McDavid. So it'll be interesting to see how the matchup game goes, uh, both for Jeff Ward and Paul Maurice, now that Ward will have the last change. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's um, something to be said about how many options there are, like you said, with the whole blender thing. Like we have 
right now 12 forwards who have been quite good and like even the ones who have been you know maybe not as good are still talented players so there's so many options to be had there and stuff so that's very um exciting so you had mentioned that um Nate Thompson um is getting healthier and that's something that um lots of people have been talking about do you believe that he slots right into the lineup because Jensen Harkins as well right is only on a short-term injury there so um what do you foresee being the move there or do you think there's anything set in stone or is it very arbitrary for now yeah, I mean, I think that uh, Paul Maurice, you're not going to see him commit to anything because, you know, generally when one person gets healthy and other guys right around the corner from being banged up or having some bumps and bruises. But, uh, you know, you could, you know, when you're looking at this arrangement, you could easily see Jansen Harkins slotting in either where Trev Trevor Lewis is or even where Christian Veselainen is. It's a much deserved promotion for me for Veselainen, but it's going to be now up to him to show what he can do when he's playing with more offensive players. I mean, I was fortunate enough to see the Moose at the end of last year in one of their last games before the break. And David Gustafson, who I'm a big fan of his game, Gustafson and Veselainen really have great chemistry together. We saw that briefly in their limited ice time in that last game against the Flames. I'd like to see more of those two together. And I think that could even be an option once Lowry or Stasty moves to the wing. But I mean, we also know that Paul Maurice uh, does love his veteran players, and I, I do think that Nate Thompson will be given an opportunity uh, to move back into that fourth line uh, center role. But I mean, the other part of the discussion, Matthew Perot finding the fountain of youth. I mean, I th given all the injuries that he had last year, and I mean, there has been an obvious decline in production, but uh, the time off was not only valuable for young players in terms of guys like Logan Stanley and you know Jansen Harkins, guys who could take care of their bodies, for some of those veterans who went through injuries the way the Perot did, and you know Trevor Lewis spoke to about uh, spoke about it as well, uh, that long break certainly has helped some of those veterans kind of re rekindle that spirit, and that's got to be one of the most positive developments for for Jets the Jets team and for fans themselves because most of the talk going into this year was about how Matthew Perot is going to be an overpaid player playing on the fourth line making four million dollars. Uh, right now he's playing on more their most consistent line and he's also been productive offensively. So, I mean, again, good on Matthew Perot. It's never been a question of effort for him, but he's back to creating that chaos on the four check. And, and when he can bring that finishing ability, it just, uh, it, it just adds another level and dynamic to, to what he brings to the table, especially when you have a, you know, guys like Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton producing and, and also throw Andrew Kopp uh, into that equation as well, even though now he's doing most of his producing uh, on one of the top two lines. Yeah, yeah, no, it's crazy. And I, I was listening to um, to uh, the episode that you had with AJ from, you know, whatever, two plus years back and we were talking about, you had mentioned Christian Veselin and you were talking about how you're excited to see him um, get a bigger role and see what he could do with the NHL club. And I think that it's uh, very encouraging for Jets fans because I know a lot of people were really quick to harp on him and say that he was a bust after that draft. And yeah. No, no, for sure. One quick one. When it comes to Veselainen, I think one of the issues was the year that he started with the Jets, went briefly to the Moose, went back home to play it in the KHL with, uh, you know, Helsinki, I think it was, or Jokerit, with his hometown team. And then he didn't go to the World Junior and he missed out on the opportunity. I think that year, didn't Finland win the gold medal? So, like, it, there was all kinds of weird stuff happening in terms of development year. Uh, then he came back to the Moose and he didn't have those eye-popping numbers, even though he was, I think, about a half point a game player as a, as, a, as a rookie in North America. So it was a steady year, but it wasn't one of those years. The Jets have had so many guys have an immediate impact upon making it in the NHL. And even if, it, you know, even though Kyle Connor spent the majority of his rookie season with the Moose, when he came out of that, he immediately became a 30 goal scorer. So I think because so many of those first rounders have hit right away, uh, there's been so much anticipation and we know that the patience level is sometimes low as, as we're also recently finding out uh, with the, uh, the free free Hanala hashtag replacing the free Niku hashtag uh, right now. So I know that's a topic I'll just quickly weigh in. I'm a huge Billy Hanala fan. Uh, I think that uh, his offensive game is ready right now. I also having covered the American league for 10, 10 years, I, I understand it's not the end of the world that he's not in there immediately. Um, Mark Scheifele, Josh Morrissey, um, all these situations are different, but neither one of those guys were full-timers at 19 and things have worked out pretty well for both of them uh, in the long run. But at the same time, I think Josh Morrissey played his best game of the year with Billy Hainala on the back end, which uh, a lot of fans noticed as well. Uh, I noticed it. I wrote the day after that I, I thought that that performance 
earned him another look, but uh, Paul Maurice did not agree with uh, my assessment, at least not in that situation. And uh, I think a lot of fans are becoming impatient in terms of when that next game will come, but uh, just so many factors. I, I think the one thing that is curious for me, uh, I think maybe at the benefit of hindsight, I wonder if the Jets wish they had instituted the Nick Robertson plan the way that the Leafs did. And I know they love having their players at the World Junior, but if Hanela was available from day one of training camp, and if he had not been in Edmonton or subject to quarantine, I wonder how different this discussion would be that we're having right now, because uh, I can guarantee you that although the Jets have been happy with the progress of Logan Stanley, I am not aware of anyone who had Logan Stanley in the lineup on game two of the season. And I tip my cap to him. I've been a, a fan of the development. I was also lucky enough to watch him at the under 18 in Grand Forks. So my early viewings were a little bit more than some. I know, it, again, there's a guy that seems to be taking a long time, but this was a guy that was drafted as a project player. And now he's kind of hitting in that stride. I mean, I think that it was probably more likely to be next year when he really got into form, but uh, I, I think that he's looked more and more comfortable. And that, again, that's not an excuse for not playing Hanela. It's just a reminder that Stanley's played two full years in the American League, so he's a little bit further along in terms of experience. And also, I'm not discounting the experience Hanela had in Liga, and he had a great start there. I think he's ready for more to chew on. But I think one of the bad things for him is that there's if the American League was playing, I think he would have gone down and played for two weeks and then he'd be even more, even closer to jumping in and making an immediate impact. But it's a great thing to monitor. Uh, I, I'll be very curious. I still contend that he'll make an impact on this Jets blue line before the year is over. But again, that, that remains to be seen, uh, whether he forces himself into an opportunity or is given one, uh, you know, because of injury or, or, or opportunity, uh, whether it's play, play dictating that as well. And uh, the other factor is Seattle expansion. I mean, the, the Jets are trying to make sure they have enough uh, players to expose in that, in that as well. So uh, many, many interesting things through 11 games, but uh, many more twists and turns to come. Yeah, we, we had our, um, our last episode was our early almost quarter season uh, report cards. We did, we did a bit of a, a discussion about kind of, and yeah, we talked about how, yeah, Stanley has been better than maybe some of us had expected, but then again, there's the whole handle a piece of um, maybe he should be playing, but then who comes out kind of thing. But I think that's really um, neat that you bring up the point that if he had been there from the beginning of training camp, if that had been better, because I saw a lot of people that were saying that it was probably better for him to be playing in the world juniors because he had fresh feet, whatever he had been playing more recently. So I think that's a really um, cool, like both sides of uh, what's better, what's worse. Is that why he's not here or is it other situations altogether? Um, any comments on Dylan Sandberg? I feel like that's our poor press box guy who hasn't, uh, <laughs> nothing's sure. come of that just yet. Just finishing the point on Hamlet too. And I'm not saying the Jets shouldn't have sent him there. I'm just wondering if, if that internal discussion has been happening and just because of how things played out. But uh, I, I've also been very impressed with Dylan Sandberg. Uh, I know I was, I was, Marat and I were, I think, two of the few uh, reporters who were there for that uh, 7 a.m. or 7.30, that first skate uh, of day one of training camp. And Sandberg, immediately you can tell he's a big, strong guy, skates very well, uh, he looks more mature than he had at prior development. At prior development camps, he had already stood out because of his size and skating ability, but you could tell that he put in uh, the effort to be ready. And again, he's been hurt by the fact that A, there were no NHL preseason games and B, there have been no American Hockey League games yet. Uh, I think his skill set is a little bit more refined than some people might expect. Is he ready right now today? I, I don't know that, but I think that the opportunity once it comes he'll be ready for it whenever that is and again I think it'll be great for both of those guys once the American League starts provided it starts in Canada sooner than later for them to go down and play those 20 plus minutes and be used in all situations and then they'll be even more ready for that opportunity when it comes because it's my contention that I mean I think it was pretty clear coming into the year that the Jets defense was sort of more on that adequate to potentially good range than maybe at the high end where they were maybe two years ago when they went to the conference final or two years and change where they were more of an elite defensive group or at least high octane in terms of the offense and size. Uh, I think the sooner that Sandberg and Hanela are regulars in the group, uh, the sooner we'll be to having the Jets um, raise that level in terms of their depth on the back end again. 
And that's not a knock on against the guys who are in there. It's just all teams in the situation that they're in are going to have to get those ELC players into the regular rotation because of the guys who are having raises already and the, the other players that are going to be given raises in this offseason coming up. So uh, both those guys, uh, I've, Jets fans should be excited about both of them. They both will have a bright future and uh, I can't wait to see them. I think that I'll also tie this together where I think that Dylan Sandberg has a little bit of Jacob Truba in him in terms of that ability to have those open ice hits and, uh, you know, impose his will physically. Uh, I, I don't anticipate he'll be a 50-point player like Jacob Truba was in his best year, but he's a very good puck mover, uh, good first pass, and he really reads the game well, and he can bring that size and, and physical play on the back end. So uh, I think that the Jets have a really interesting defense core moving forward. There's some other prospects at the American League level and playing overseas, but uh, the ones that are, you know, almost ripe or getting closer to ripe, uh, really have the ability to to really be both probably be top four guys eventually. And and then too, just the last thing about the defense, I mean, Neil Pionk, the job that Neil Pionk and Derek Forbert have done in that shutdown role is, has been exemplary uh, so far. The biggest question about the Jets defense is how Forbert or would Forbert be able to handle those top four minutes? Uh, yes, it's a small sample size, but uh, that's been a resounding yes so far. And I think he's impressed not only with his way that he's played defensively and adding a physical element uh, but he's chipped in offensively to a de great degree as well. And then the other part, he's become a, a schoolyard uh, street hockey goalie uh, with a couple of saves this year already. So that that's uh, where he's made a, a big mark as well. Yeah, no, that was, uh, he's been a very pleasant, I wouldn't necessarily say surprise uh, for me personally, like I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but he's been, yeah, really great so far. And it's the Pionk tearing has been, I've been a huge fan personally, and it's been good. It's good that there's some encouragement. I know people have been hard on our decor over the years, just because, um, you know, losing Truba and Bufflin in that short uh, amount of time is tough as well as Enstrom too. So you're, it's tough, but um, that's hockey, right? So um, we're running out of time on our Zoom call. So I um, this is going to be, like I would sort of said, a media episode, so we're going to have a couple different guests, and I wanted to ask all three of our guests uh, the same question at the end, so this is going to put you on the spot, Ken. No problem. If you could pick one player right now to add to this Jets team to make us better, who would you pick and why? Oh, boy. Uh, what's, my, <laughs> what's my budget? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, you can make a trade. I don't know. That's uh, There's no budget. Just just pick somebody that's not well, Conor McDavid, because that takes I, up the one. <laughs> no, fair enough. I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, even with Tucker Pullman coming back, I think that probably the, the number one priority for the Jets uh, in a fantasy world trade would be a, a big right shot defenseman. I would say Colton Pareko would be the, uh, you know, high, kind of upper echelon player. I, again, I don't see the Jets making a blockbuster for him, but uh, both Sean and I have been fortunate to cover the Blues uh, during their their Stanley Cup run year, not just against the Jets, but also in that next round against Dallas. And uh, the effort that Pareko put forth with Jay Bolmeister on the Blues shutdown pairing in that playoff was uh, absolutely exceptional. But uh, I don't think that deal will be happening, but uh, that would probably be uh, my number one choice in terms of what could help the Jets most uh, immediately right now. Nice. That's a good answer. I like that. The, the defense is always important. That's a, that's a good one. So, uh, Ken, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day um, to come chat with us today. It was lots of fun, um, lots of good insight here, and lots of positive points to think about going forward. So, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the rest of the season and the rest of the show.